So, multiple friends have told me, after watching last week's video, how satisfying, calming, and even persuasive my voice can be. Now that I know this, the obvious next step is to use my voice for evil and manipulate as many people as possible. I see you, and I know that you know that subscribing on YouTube is free. I also know how smart you are, and that you know how to scroll down and how to find that subscribe button. And I'm well aware of your mastery of multitasking, and how you're more than capable of listening to me while you push that button. Push that button. And if you're watching in full screen, I want you to know I'm here for you. And I'll be here as long as you need while you figure out how to minimize the video and then scroll down to push that button. Push that button. You got this. Just imagine after you subscribe, push that button. One day soon. You'll get notified that you have another opportunity to listen to me talk Push that button. simply because you were smart enough to listen to me now. All right, enough of that silliness. Let's get back to the video. In the second video of me creating new work during ketamine therapy, I discuss aesthetic related topics like the importance of ambiguity in activating an art viewer's imagination. I also discuss how practicing with adjectives to describe ambiguity actually helps us to more easily access our imaginations when engaging with art that depicts unfamiliar or ambiguous content. So I hope you enjoy. Here we go. Here we are, back again. Try something a little different today. I uh, just had my ketamine shot about a minute ago, um, and we're going to get into it. All right, we'll just kind of, this is almost like uh, warming up at the gym. We're just kind of stretching, playing around, seeing where we are. So as usual, the uh, the first sensations of the effects are a um, a shimmering on the edge of your vision, and it's a slow transition into a tunnel vision kind of sensation, like uh, difficulty difficulty focusing on um, on what I'm looking at. I try to kind of maximize that by just looking at shapes, contours, and it's almost like um, it's almost like looking at one of those um, I don't know mirages or um, magic eye kind of visual things where your vision gets crossed. Everything becomes very. Um, Reduce down shapes, reduce down into basic forms, and you begin to feel gravity. You begin to feel yourself getting pulled into the seat. Everything starts to get a little heavier. Everything starts to go sideways. We're just kind of exploring the field. Music has a real interesting effect on um, ketamine treatment. Uh, it really kind of sets the stage, or sets the tone. And you can kind of notice that sometimes. 
when you're when you're in the, when you're in the middle of it when you're in the middle of it and um, you're traveling down one path and then suddenly the song changes and it just completely takes you down a different path So like as uh, I was saying, music definitely has a has a big impact on the direction that you move in during the experience. All right, so right now my color my color field is completely washed. I'm looking at nothing but just like purples, yellows, and blues. Oh, this is tough. Alright, let's see. Where to? Hmm. So right now I'm just letting myself slip into it. Just trying to enjoy the experience. Hmm. Get into it. Hmm. Right. I'm just going to keep bouncing here. Wrapping around. Sorry, I was lost in a moment there. Like, I, I look at this right now, and this, visually, for me right now, <laughs> under the influence of, of uh, ketamine, this is visually fascinating for me. But I'm wondering also, like, does this matter at all to somebody else? We're just watching this? Which brings about the question, like, what is it about the drug itself, the influence of the drug, that's causing this sense of fascination. It's definitely the sense of visuals moving. What's, what's being activated is, um, part of it is the sense of fascination with movement and light, I think is really what ketamine kind of helps grab hold of in the brain I mean, obviously, movement and light are, are two, two natural forces that, when it comes to uh, stimuli that the brain responds to. But movement and light is at the foundational level of what aesthetics are. The way the eye captures something moving left to right, right to left, grabs our attention and then the gradations between darks and light areas and when you combine those two in harmony it's like peanut butter and jelly <laughs> for the brain in a sense I like how we have some just perfect circles here. I want to leave some of them there to kind of give it an effervescent kind of feel to it. Speaking of effervescence, you know, one of the interesting ways about like teaching art 
in art theory is really about getting people to open up to thinking of things that they experience in terms of adjectives. Like, how can I describe the thing I am seeing And that's really uh, a big part of that is activating the imagination because there's that uh, linguistic aspect of I'm trying to generate meaning out of something and then I have to be able to articulate it in some way. But there's also the um, the syntax of it, just the, the basic raw materials at the underlying levels. Is nice. So when viewing art, um, what we find is that people that have a lot of experience at art viewing are really good at having um, unique interpretations or unique encounters with um, with those experiences. So the more you experience art, the more individualized your experience with art becomes. Which really means, well, it's not that it really means, but to me, it sounds like that says, you're just really getting better and better at finding the nuances in adjectives. Because you're getting better at being able to describe what you are perceiving, your sensory modalities are sending you information and you are becoming, better is not the right word here, but you are becoming more individualized or more unique in um, your capacity to articulate the processing of the information that you're perceiving from the external environment. So a lot of our teachers will um, start two-dimensional uh, design courses. These are usually foundational courses for, their, for, for undergraduate um, art students. And early in the semester, what they'll do is, um, or I don't know, maybe, I think a lot of people do this, I did this, but um, what you do is you get like a piece of paper and just give them black ink and just let them just create marks with the black ink anywhere and everywhere on that piece of paper with whatever they can, with the fingerprint, the bottom of their shoe, a brush, um, a hammer, whatever they, however they want to, to just make some kind of mark, some kind of designation. That is the, the mark itself is the syntax uh, onto the paper, the substrate. And now you have this kind of foreground background relationship. And then um, what, the, what the teachers would do, or what I would do, um, was ask the students to cut out a four inch by five inch frame within there so look at this big piece of paper let's say you know you give a student a 16 by 20 inch piece of paper and then you ask them with they have all these marks on it with ink with black ink um, and then you know pick a, a four by five a four inch by five inch rectangle from there cut that out and let's put it on the wall and then all the students start to look at it and then the next assignment is to label it with adjectives. So giving the students you know, a long list of adjectives to, um, to, to call upon while they're looking at this, this work on the wall. And that kind of helps train the, um, train the brain, I guess. <laughs> To, to make that connection between like perceivable elements that pure ambiguity you know anything from from anything out of nature that, that is perceivable 
is pure ambiguity. It's our brain that generates the meaning for it. Um, but it connects that ambiguity to a lexical component, to a, a meaning-making component. It's very easy when you... Um, when you sit in front of a work of art that you don't understand, that makes no sense to you, to just be like, I don't get it, I don't know, I don't understand. It takes a little bit of effort to actually try to generate meaning from something that's just pure ambiguity, say like, for example, an in, in abstract scene, an abstract image, or, or abstract sounds. Uh, you have to invest into it cognitively to, to, to create that meaning. There is no available meaning coming from the environment because it's, it's all unknown, it's all am, ambiguous. And the way the brain does that is by calling upon the imagination, not by calling upon um, automatic processes such as like object recognition and things like that so instead of using convergent thinking the brain is using divergent thinking to try to create meaning and it's not creating meaning in any kind of definitive way uh it, it's just there the imagination is just trying to provide options in a sense it's like it could be this it could be that i mean think about for example um just laying in the grass, looking up at the clouds, the cloud itself, you know, the, the shapes itself, the, the shapes are pure ambiguity, but if you give it enough time, they start to resemble an elephant. They start to resemble a banana. They start to resemble a Volkswagen. And that's your imagination at play. It's your imagination through divergent thinking giving you options, presenting options to you. That's kind of right at the core of what great art does. It's only purpose. It serves only one purpose, and that is to be the object of its own contemplation. Art is not there to make you coffee in the morning. Art doesn't give you uh, projections on how well your retirement fund is doing. Art doesn't help count your calories. Art doesn't do any of that. Art simply provides you an opportunity to take time and flex your imagination not as the artist but as the viewer as the audience we always think about art and creativity and imagination in the sense of being from the artists but the most important part is the imagination of the viewer the imagination of the audience that's that's where it's at I am loving this area right here and right here. All of this, it almost feels like somewhere between like jellyfish, muscle fibers, um, <laughs> jelly beans. Just something's being sprayed. Cell fibers, carpet maybe. I like that. So yeah, so back to the imagination and like the idea of adjectives. It really is about, at least in my opinion, being comfortable. Being comfortable with describing ambiguity 
being comfortable and confident in um, in tr expressing yourself and articulating and I don't mean as the artist again I'm, I'm talking about as the viewer as the audience of a work um, to be able to take the time to look at something that is confusing or complicated a uh, work of art I mean uh, that is confusing and complicated um, and trying to have an engagement with it like to 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 contemplate it to sit there and work through it it's not there to be enjoyed it's there to be engaged with it does take effort unfortunately I, I, <laughs> I kind of forgot my point <laughs> I got lost in the mix. I, I so desperately want to make that a finger because it, it has that basic shape of a finger pressing down on something. Beep, beep. But no. It also has kind of a bird, like a swan or a crane, not a swan, a crane. The brain loves patterns. One of the biggest parts of object recognition is to be able to uh, spot patterns, learn to recognize that which is familiar. I think good art kind of bridges the gap between providing enough ambiguity to activate the imagination and providing enough patterns or recognizable content to create, to, to be used as uh, the source material for, for something meaningful on an individual level. So you think of like um, something that is like a, a one-liner um, would be like um, art with a definitive propaganda, like a definitive message, like a one-liner message. This is what I meant to say. Here is the imagery that depicts what I want you to understand. Boom, that's it, that's all. That's, you know, there's, there's no imagination involved in that unless the person is comfortable activating their own imagination. And some people are just not really comfortable or aware of how to activate their own imagination. Like all of this, what, what I'm moving, the, these little pixels, I don't know why, I just keep, I, I have the impression that I am stretching fabric. I am loving this. This, this field right here just looks amazing. Just one tiny little corner. It's almost like a little landscape. I love those waves. And that was it for this video. It seems that I turned the mic off and spent the last few minutes talking to myself. But if you're still here, thank you, thank you for your attention. Please drop a like and why not hit the free subscription button? Also, leave a comment if you have thoughts on the video. Sharing is caring and I really want to hear from you. Anyway, cheers for now.